Hi, I'm Mark Bielan from Search Lab. This is Suds and Search. We're at Off Color Brewing in Old Town. I'm joined today by Chris Madden from Matchnode. Chris, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Mark. We're trying their canned beers. I think they're very good, by the way. Um, very, very far is what I'm having. So, Belgian style ale mixed fermented with white wine yeast. Very nice. So, Chris, we met uh, about two years ago. You have a great reputation. You and your partner, Brian, have a great reputation Thank as you. paid social experts, but also really analytics experts, data, data junkies. Um, tell us a little bit about Matchnode and what you guys do. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, like you said, we're a digital marketing agency here in Chicago. Um, we have, from the beginning, but became very clear in our marketing year and a half, two years ago, that we really focus, specialize on paid social, like you said, that is Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, we can get into a lot more detail about that as we go, I'm sure, but you know, on the, if you put agencies on a spectrum between creative and analytical, we'd be far on the analytical data-driven side. Not that you have to be one or the other, but because uh, there's a ton of creativity in what we do, but yeah, you're right, we're very data-driven. And I wanted to get some definitional things out of the way. Paid sure. social, you're not a social media marketing agency. Yeah. Um, what role do you, what, what, you made a choice there. Why not organic social? What, what, what changed that... Good there question. Aren't these social media marketing agencies. Anymore. Yeah, good question. We we do make a clear distinction between paid social and organic social. You said organic social. That's that's the distinction we make there. Um, organic social is generally posting with no money behind it. It's not an ad. It's just a post, or it's community management, or it is um, you know scheduled posting and listening and things like that. Um, very early on we were interested in Facebook ads and excited by Facebook ads and kind of out on the cutting edge of Facebook ads. It's where our enthusiasm was, it's where our interest was, it's where our best clients were. And um, around that time, this is five, six, I mean, even before Matchnode formally started, like seven, eight, nine years ago, right when Facebook ads started, we were doing this work. Um, and people over years started to complain and notice that organic reach was dwindling. So there's this big thing, right, when Facebook started, you could make a post and everybody who's your friend would see it. Of course, as it got bigger and bigger, the organic reach has dwindled to zero. So for a lot of businesses out there, uh, organic social just doesn't move the needle, whereas you could take $100 or $1,000 in ads and reach thousands of people. Um, so for us, it was just a question of impact. We had a hard time. We haven't ever really tried to sell organic social, but just like the value of um, return we can bring and the scalability is, is purely a paid social play in our opinion, or at least that's what we specialize in. In SEO, we talk about, you know, really Google. There are these other search engines, but we're really, when we're talking, we're usually talking about Google. Yeah. Is that, are Facebook and Instagram that, do they have that kind of control over social media marketing and paid social? Will you dabble on LinkedIn? Will you dabble on Twitter? We will dabble for clients when they ask us to or when there's a test we run, want to run or if there's a very specific reason. You know, we've had, like, uh, recruiting agencies and LinkedIn makes sense for them. Um, but when, you know, I would say 85 to 90% of the work is on Facebook, and that includes Instagram because, of course, um, Instagram's back end, its ads engine is just Facebook Ads Manager because Facebook owns right. Instagram. So those two together are 85 to 90% of the work okay. we do, and I, I think roughly, uh, that's not a precise step, but I, I would guess that's like the, the rough amount of ad spend on Facebook and Instagram versus everything else, and everything else is Pinterest, Twitter, LinkedIn, I guess Snapchat, and um, we have and do do work on those platforms uh, for clients. It's just a small piece for you know reasons we could get into. It's just much more expensive. It doesn't just doesn't work as well. I was listening to a podcast you had with our mutual friend Andy Crestodina, and I was really interested. And he made a distinction between the psychology of the search marketer, uh, the, the person typing. He said, you know, they're typing instead of scrolling. Uh, a social. What is the? How do you help describe the psychology of a? of a social customer, a lead for your customer? Um, your good question. First of all, I think if you put, like, you bang two marketers in Chicago together and you're going to be mutual friends with Andy Crestadina. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, but the, um, the psychology of, I guess, search versus social, when we talk about search and social internally and talk to clients or prospects about it, we talk about it in terms of demand. So um, I've heard Andy's point there that like someone's specifically intentfully looking for something when they're making a search on Google, uh, whereas I think his point is that um, on your social feed, you're just like 
passively flipping through and waiting to be entertained by something or see a picture of a you know baby or a friend right. or something. Um, so, uh, however, we talk about it like I said in terms of demand. So we describe how uh, on search. Uh, you're basically fulfilling demand. So people have an, have an interest, they have an intent, they need to buy shoes because they know that the shoes that they have at home are worn out and their feet hurt or they're going out somewhere and they know they need new shoes for some wedding or something. And so there's something going on in their life or on their feet that causes this intent. Um, Facebook and Instagram, on the other hand, we say can generate demand. So okay. Um, I, like, I may not have woken up with this desire to get new shoes, but right. I see this amazing, you know, image, advertisement, video of a certain kind of shoes that just catches me at the right moment, and it sparks me a little bit and generates something where I think, you know, maybe I do need shoes, like mm -hmm. I kind of could, and so it can drive more of that, um, drive more of that demand versus just kind of fulfilling. And so for scalability and for certain, like all the D2C, D2C clients, direct-to-consumer, which we don't have too many, all that e-commerce stuff, but that for companies that want to introduce themselves to the market, introduce a new product, no one's searching for that. So yeah. that's where paid social gets really powerful. All right, terrific. And I want to move on to some more data questions here. One of the things about MatchNote is you have your own tool. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel like you guys needed to create a tool? What was lacking in the, in the space? Um, or maybe this is just a better way to, to serve your, your clients. Yeah, it, it, it is, certainly. That's why we've built it, and that's why we're still developing it. Um, Facebook ads changes every day. Um, so, yeah. like, for reasons that have nothing to do and are completely beyond our control or anyone's control, something can happen, like, in the political world that might just, like, suck all the, you know, yeah. attention out of the platform sure. for a day. And if you're running a really important test for a client on that particular day, you're going to see weird results. And you're going to think, why did that happen? So, um we built this tool for two reasons, macro and micro. In the big picture and the macro, we can take all the data we have across all accounts that we have and put it into one big view. So we can say, wait, cost per click across the entire platform was up yesterday, or the CPM yesterday was up, independent of anything that we did across in any particular account. So that gives us context for a particular micro thing we might be doing in a particular yeah. account. Okay. Uh, in the micro, uh, we are able to track what changes we make in the ad platform and then what the results were driven in that, based on that change, like what was the data-driven result of that test. So uh, we can say three days ago we launched this video in this account, and it's just like a Google Analytics annotation where you're like, this day we did this thing, but the difference between this and Google Analytics is that it, um, it shows you this change made, and here's the data around it. Beforehand, you had this much spend in these conversions. After that change, it was, you know, here's what your performance has been, so you can compare very cleanly. It creates a record going back. So what was there before this? First of all, what's the tool? Do you brand the tool? Yeah, we call it the DS, which is DS. an acronym for decision support. So that's what it does. It's like our ad operators are putting their actions into the tool, and then they get support to understand okay, was this decision moving us in the right direction? What are the actual stats behind this test? There's just so much data and there's so much to get. It's impossible for any particular human any day to walk in and get their head around everything that happened. So we're just giving our teammates and our ad operators support in the decision. So yeah, we call it the DS. But what was there before? What were you using to measure these things? Was it Google Analytics and Facebook's? Yeah, so Facebook Analytics is awesome. Google Analytics is awesome. Um, uh, Facebook's attribution tool is new and is awesome and does a lot of cross-channel stuff. So there's like other cross-device and cross-channel tools we used to use that like we don't, now don't need anymore because it's all in Facebook. Um, so there's no doubt that they provide a lot of data. But the things that we couldn't do were we couldn't, again, get a performance of the platform as a whole on any particular day. So we're just looking account by account. Yeah. which is always like looking in the micro. Um, and then there was no way to... Uh, really with a data-driven view, mark a change, mark a moment, mark something that we did, and just, just like set up the parameters for what the test was, and then have a record of what the data is. Um, yeah. There's one more even like deeper layer of the thing that you can't do. So on Facebook, there's tons of awesome graphs in Facebook ads, but those graphs would be like account level or campaign level. If you want to go deeper and be like, I want to see this ad set, or I want to see this ad, weirdly, you can't get any graphs related to that. Mm. So that's something that we can do in our tool as well. That's really interesting. Um, 
how do you go about, one of the things you mentioned was an experiment. How do you go about setting up a good social media marketing experiment? What are, what are I mean, good, that's a... Good question, like a test? <laughs> yeah, how do, you, how do you do a good test? Um, well, you have to be asking the right question first. Uh, I think that's probably the most important thing. Like, there's the classic, like, red button or green button, but, like, that's not a good question, you yes. know, uh, right. usually. So usually there's a, there's a business question at hand, okay. um, and we know something about our client's uh, strategy or, or target market or maybe two different targets that we might test or a particular way that we're messaging someone or a hero image that speaks to the target market in a certain way. So it, it could, I think picking the right test is the hardest part. And then like the mechanics of how you execute a test, there's, there's a lot to it, of course, but like you really just want to keep it simple and try to keep it clean, make sure you have a big enough sample. Um, you can, we use unbounced landing pages a lot. There's so yep. many tools now where you can A-B test things and, and get, okay. really clear, get really clear outcomes. But then there's also A-B testing um, at the Facebook level now, where you can split audiences into exact groups and just run it out across three to five groups, and they'll test that for you. So there's more and more tools like in Facebook ads that will allow you to run a clean A-B test. But like, I'm okay admitting that a lot of the tests become a mix of art and science. Like, yeah, yeah. of course we want to say every test is perfectly statistically significant, but sometimes like the client or the business or something has happened that we like have to move on. Yeah, and so. There's so much data to it, but there's also a level of like intuition, creativity that at some point we're just like have to make a decision. So, uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on testing. It's up to each business, and we help our clients with this to decide like how, like what rules and parameters and lines they're going to set, and how they're going to measure it all, and then sticking to that and understanding what those decisions mean. So, um, Facebook's default attribution is 28 day click and one day view. Okay. So if anyone clicks an ad in the, past 20, in the past 28 days and then buys the thing today, it's going to show up on that day that they clicked that ad, even if it was 14 days ago, as a conversion. Uh, it's 29 days? You're 29 days, it doesn't count. Okay. And same thing if it's a, a, a view. So if you just saw an ad today and, and bought something, that's also going to count. Now, you can go right into Facebook's ads manager and change all that. You can make it one-day click and zero-day view. You can make it seven-day click and seven-day view. You can change it to whatever you want to be. Um, so it's just important to look at those numbers if you're trying to th figure these things out and get a sense of what that means. Like, if I take out all the view-through attribution, what am I really looking at? We're only looking at people who click down ads. And then uh, Facebook, and there's other tools, too but give you a cross-device look with their attribution tool. Yeah. And so this is not just reporting on Facebook ads, Facebook pixels on our websites, presumably. So um, it will also show organic traffic. It will show Google search traffic, just like Google Analytics does. And, but the difference between this tool and what Google Analytics, at least free Google Analytics shows you, is the cross-device story. Yeah. So it'll say, uh, you know, Mark saw, clicked on a Facebook ad for these yeah, shoes I was, I was three weeks ago, yeah, and then, and then two days ago, he clicked on a he did a search and he clicked on a paid search ad. Today he clicked on a branded search ad and then he did organic all you know today and then he bought it. So like how do you how do you determine the attribution there? And so you know Google Analytics and its tools allows you to balance those models if you want to do like you know the original click and the last click are worth the most and in the middle it's worth less or it can just be like the most recent clicks are worth more than the oldest clicks or it can be you know, a lot of our clients, just for the sake of simplicity, just say, like, we're only dealing with last click. Mm -hmm. And then we just have to live in that world. And that sometimes stinks for us it's as paid social guy. marketers because we lose a lot of attribution in that yeah. story because kind paid social guys, can, can happen sure. at the front yeah. and, 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 and drive this, you know, demand generation, this, like, moment of, like, oh, now I know what that product is and not get credit on the end if you're only looking at last click because right. direct and direct and organic are going to get a lot of those last clicks yeah. done at the end of the attribution funnel. Well, at the risk of uh, geeking out too much, I, I loved your presentation on cross-device uh, cross testing. I think it would be worth defining it a little bit. Who, what, what does that mean, and how does paid social really... You're in a really unique position to, to do that really, really well. Yeah, thank you. Um, cross-device tracking is basically this idea that... Um, I have a phone in my pocket, and I have a desktop in my office, and I have a tablet at home, and all of those devices are me, 
and I might uh, see an ad on my phone, you know, whatever, when I'm on my commute. And um, I might then go to my desktop and buy, just like open up, search for that company and buy that thing. Well then like, how do we, you know, how do we attribute that? And so that's what cross device tracking is. It's like, we live in a multi-device world. If you're only looking one device at a time, it's really hard to figure out. Um, especially with like the Google basis, all the cookie based tracking that mm -hmm. has been so prominent traditionally, it's basically like just tracks your browser. So much different from tracking all of your devices like Facebook can because I sign into Facebook on all of my devices which so says, ah, that's Chris on his phone, that's Chris on his tablet, that's Chris on his desktop. Yeah. What Google does or what cookie based tracking does is it just tracks the browser. So I have Firefox and Chrome on my desktop and I have them both open and I can like the activity I do on one isn't caught on the other, or they don't, or Google doesn't, Google Analytics doesn't tie that together yeah. traditionally. And so uh, what that yields is like a very broken story of like, sure. what, what were the things that I did that work that drove to this sale? Because you're not even correctly capturing the behaviors that drove to that sale. So there was a class of tools like, you know, and there still are, but there were popular like two to seven years ago mm -hmm. that you could put this on your site and it would tie it together. Um, and uh, the reality is Facebook can tie it together and they released this attribution tool like a year ago okay. and it basically does all the same things. Um, so things like lifetime value, say if it's an e-commerce situation, lifetime value is like almost, a, and cohort analysis, those things are like very difficult to do if you're not doing cross-device, cross-session tracking. Sure. Yeah. I want to ask you about some metrics as sort of like a newbie. What do what role do? likes and shares and kind of these interaction metrics. You mentioned conversions when you talk. Yeah. Um, you don't really mention anything else. Do you even treat that as uh, something no. you report to a client? No. It, means it no. makes no difference, huh? Some clients will ask us mm -hmm. at the beginning, like, well, how much do we pay for a like? And we're like, don't. Yeah. Um, it can be a signal. So clients we spend a lot of money for because we're driving sales and we know that they're getting $4 in the door for every dollar they spend, for example. And we're like, things are going well, so we'll juice the spend. And like, yeah, we'll see that they got more likes on their page just because like the data is sitting there. Right. But like, we don't do anything to try to drive that. Now like, a share is good. You're getting a little more reach for free, maybe, but uh, it's just not something that comes up on our radar. Like it's mm. like, if it helps, to get a return on investment, like a higher return on ad spend or a lower cost per lead or whatever it is that particular campaign is going for, we would do it. But it it, it has no relevance to us these days. Going yeah. back to what we started with, which is like there's no organic reach, like why are you paying for a like if they're never gonna see what you put out? That's a great like point. it's just yeah. it's something that's left over from five years ago, seven years ago when Facebook that's first started yeah, running that's ads. All right. yeah. yeah. So what uh, what metrics do you look at beyond the conversion? How do you get, how do you start to tie the thing together that we're, we're yeah. looking at it, you know? Well, so going back to the attribution uh, piece, if, if the client has a clear point of view on that and we all understand what that is and we say, this is how we're going to attribute, and usually we use Facebook's default attribution and they understand that and we talk about that. But like assuming all that is understood, the way that we uh, tie it all together is in, in the metrics that we do look at are almost always in an e-commerce situation or when like we can see the revenue and see the sale happen online, okay. it's cost per purchase or and ROAS, return on ad spend, which yep. are related. So cost per purchase is just very simply how much money did we spend, how many purchases did we drive? If uh, you know a t-shirt retailer has an average order of $40 yeah. and we, uh, and we, they want to say a cost per purchase of $10 because they spend $10 in ads, they get $40 in revenue, they have to pay for the t-shirts, they have to pay for sure. shipping, there's profit. So like that would be a four row as, you know, $10 in revenue, or excuse me, yeah. $10 in spend, $40 in revenue, it's a four row as. Um, and then of course when you're budgeting and you're spending $1,000 or $10,000, you can figure out that math. Sure. Uh, and so row as and cost per purchase would almost always be it for an e-commerce company. We run a lot of campaigns for leads, and and almost always that's cost per lead. Okay. Uh, however, there's some of our really large clients who spend lots of money. We'll have like uh, lead scoring. You know, like this particular that's company great, yeah. doesn't get a uh, doesn't get revenue from the leads. Lead scoring. So that's like, does that mean 
Yeah. Does it mean so what I think it means? Does it mean like this company you know, sells leads to financial institutions? So okay. like, so based on the credit score and the location of a particular lead, they can yeah. model out like how much they're gonna they're likely to get from their bank partners, for yeah. instance. So if it's a, a lousy contact form, yep. it's scored out of the Yeah. And then we'll take the all that data that's come out on the back end. They've been like, these are the good leads last month. Yeah, the like, Gary leads. And, and, <laughs> exactly. And yeah. so we'll take those leads and we'll make a look like audience of those leads, not just all of the leads, like only the good leads. So I have some questions. Again, these are going to be kind of newbie questions. I, I apologize, but don't getting it getting it set up. So I'm going to have to have a creative. This is the first time we've really even talked about anything with the ad itself. Um, how do you go about? You're such an analytical guy. You're, you you really are like a very smart data guy. How do you guys go about making ads that are going to convert? Do you have a whole other wing to the? To the to match note that I don't know about. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, we definitely have people who are creative. I have a whole yeah. other wing to my brain that maybe you don't know about. I did used to direct music videos. I, I've been sorry. on these sorts of setups before I'm in the sorry, past. It's, it's, That's okay. Okay, no, sure. no, no, no. Um, but like I would, you know, I would say that making great ads is both creative and analytical, and you know, understanding yeah. data is both creative and analytical. So. Um, we know because we've run so much data and we've run so many ads, we have such a big sample size like in our collective agency brain that we just like, at this point, we know what works. Uh, we have a lot of resources and I definitely don't want to put out there that like we, we're not creative. Yeah. It's just kind of like um, we're, we're resourceful, I would mm -hmm. say. Like we take the resources they tend to have, they being our clients, we'll even use stock footage, like whatever we have to do to get a, a video that works is kind of our, our approach. Some things I'm thinking about, and I, I wonder if I'm mistaken. So and when I think about a good ad, I think about something that disrupts a pattern. So I'm kind of scrolling, yeah. and I need something that's like, wow, that stops me from looking at yeah. my next friend's uh, baby picture. Yeah. Is that sort of the goal? Is like you want, you want this to sort of stop that? that sort of yeah. pattern? Yeah, definitely that helps. You have, that, that would be a thing. So let's say that we were working with a client that we expected the ads to go well on and we turn them on and they don't get off to as good of a start as we thought. We might dive in and be like, why are they not working? Well, of course we would dive in and be like, why is it not as good as we thought? And if we, if we saw that the click-through rate was low and the cost per click was high, we'd be like, ah, something about this creative is not grabbing people. And that'd be an example where we'd go and dive in on creative. There was a dozen or a hundreds of other things it could be that would cause us to do something else, like change an audience or change a landing page or something. But if, if people aren't clicking on it, then yes. Um, Andy, and it's like a kind of an obvious thing now, but like pattern interruption is important visually as we're scrolling through stuff all day. And Facebook talks about it in terms of thumb stopping content. Just like in the mobile world, it's just like you're flipping with, I'm, I flip with my thumb so fast, like what makes you stop to your point? Yeah. And so video helps with that. Um, there's just all sorts of tricks that change all the time. There's new video apps all coming out all the time that allow you to like very inexpensively shoot something that you can add that animation to that causes someone to stop for a second. We don't spend tons of time trying to trick someone or trying to use yeah. like a trying to like trying to come up with a little tactic just to get someone to the page because if those like sometimes those incremental clicks aren't the ones you want anyway, and it's more sometimes we do the opposite where if we have like a, where we want fewer people to click. So if we have like a, say a premium product we're selling that's expensive um, yeah. and we don't want people clicking if they want the cheap thing right. that they're, that this, you know, company is selling. And so we'll put the price just like in the ad and people will be like, oh, I'm not yeah. clicking on that. I, I'm used to paying $24 for this and it's 110. Like, Whereas the people who are like, oh, I like $110 yeah, right, right. umbrellas. <laughs> Not a real example. I never thought of it, an ad being too effective, where you're like, huh. you're actually getting just, you're just getting too many people. clicks. Yeah, too yeah. many clicks. Yeah, so. If you got tons of clicks and like the conversion yeah. rate's low to the point where you're wasting oh, money, money, it's yeah. not as good. I'd rather get, yeah. you're like, and so that, that can be a thing too. We've had times where clients ask us, like, how, you know, how many clicks are we getting and how can we get more clicks? And it's kind of like, well, we can get more clicks. We can run right. a campaign that's optimized for landing page views or optimized yeah. for clicks, but that, like, we're really just optimizing for the outcome that your business is driving for, which would be like a sale or whatever. Gotcha. And sometimes that means fewer clicks. All right, so now we know we've got the, 
we've got a great ad, we've got a great creative, um, maybe we've got a few that we can test. I, I want to talk about audience targeting a little bit because I'm not yeah. totally knowledgeable about it. From, from a paid search, we know we can target by geography, we have these affinity audiences, we have yeah. a few things we can do in search. Where is the big fault line between search and social where you guys can really drill into an audience? This is the biggest part, I think, of, in my opinion, the whole thing for Facebook ads is just like the ability to target as well as you can. And it's one of the things I think we're outstanding at. But the simple answer is lookalike audiences are what works. Okay. And that's not new or original or groundbreaking. And lookalike audiences are essentially taking uh, a group that you provide Facebook. So this could be your customers. Say, you know, we've had a thousand buyers in the past six months. I want more buyers. So I'm going to say, upload those thousand buyers securely to Facebook and say, these are the people we want to find more of them. And so you create a lookalike audience and you create a 1% lookalike audience, which would be the 1% of people in your area. So if you're targeting the United States, 200 million people on Facebook in the United States, so 1% would be 2 million. So you have 2 million people that are most like your list of 1,000. And then, yeah, you could cut that by geography. Generally, um, the larger the audience, the better, almost always now in Facebook. Okay. Um, because the algorithm has gotten so good yeah, that yeah. you basically want to like leave it open and give, yeah. it, give it more and more ability to ch pick and choose who they're going to show the ad to because they're on the hook for your like cost per conversion or your ROAS. Um, so the 1% lookalike audience really works, but you can create a 1% lookalike audience of so many different sources. So yeah, you might have a thousand customers be like, this is 1% lookalike of our past six month customers. Great. You could do 1% lookalike of our our best customers. So like I said before, the top decile, your top 10% or maybe your top 25% by revenue or something. Uh, or maybe they bought a particular product category on your site because you're going to target those people. So 1% of people who bought umbrellas is different of 1% of people who bought shoes if you're selling umbrellas and shoes on the same website, I guess yep. Amazon does. Um, so so it gets, you can, re like, you find a source list that's like a thousand people or larger and then you create a lookalike audience off of it is the place to start. The, um, I mentioned using a list for that to kind of see that lookalike, the thousand people buy, a thousand buyers that you're uploading and saying this is my list of buyers. You can also, like if you have an e-commerce site, you can also automate that and use the pixel to say, I want to, I want to look like guys of my buyers. And so instead of manually uploading those thousand people, those thousand people all hit your thank you page. And so you're saying, going forward, anybody who hits my thank you page, add them to my audience. Like so it. then your like lookalike is constantly updating as far as like what is seeding your lookalike. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's a lot to it. Um, and then the super 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 pro tip right now, which is very <laughs> new and now, is like those one percent lookalike audiences are what do it. But um, there's now a thing where instead of the instead of the budget being set at the ad set level, you'd be like spend fifty dollars a day on this one percent lookalike, and fifty dollars a day on one percent lookalike B. You spend a hundred dollars a day at the campaign level and tell Facebook to just split it however it wants wow. to between those two ad sets. And instead of doing two 1%, although you could, you would do your best 1% and then like a totally untargeted ad set. So just untargeted, everybody. Mm. And Facebook will decide now, okay, am I going to go with this 1% precise lookalike because that's where the next conversion is for the rate that they want to pay for it? Or do we go to this giant pool? And the more data it gets, like it's getting 50 and 100 conversions in the first couple of weeks, it will start to know in that bigger audience oh, who the people yeah. are they can go to, and you see the budget start to move over the bigger audience. And that's really interesting. That's how we're yeah. scaling campaigns right now, but and that's a larger thing where Facebook's just telling us like totally untargeted audiences, put all of your products in a product catalog, um, like all of your placements, Facebook, Instagram, Facebook right side, Facebook mobile, Facebook desktop, news, news feed, all these places you can run ads, just put them all in and okay. let the algorithm do it. It's not as simple as it sounds, but that's generally yeah. the guidance that we're getting on audiences and setup. I love that. And I wanted you to entertain some, some oddball questions about social media. Sure. So this will, this will probably be my, my last few. So I saw a comedian, Bonnie McFarlane. She's very funny. Mm -hmm. uh, Don't know her, but check her out. She, uh, she tweeted, I wish my husband knew me as well as my Instagram ads. <laughs> How do they know so much about... Uh, one of the things I think people ask us a lot is like, how do they know I was talking about oh, man. breweries? It's a weird one. And then all of a sudden, brewery ads show up in my Instagram feed. It's a weird one. Yeah. Um, Instagram ads do know me very well, I feel like. <laughs> and that's a good joke because it's true. 
Uh, and some of the things I was just describing are reasons why Gear and Scrim ads know you that well. And the pixel-based thing, like you can say, people who've been on my website or people who are like most on my website or people who visited these particular pages of my website but not these pages. So you can just get like really specific to show someone an ad of a thing that they just saw. And, and then um, the targeting is so good that you just start to see things in your Instagram feed. There's times where I like, like the ads in my Instagram feed more than I like the <laughs> pictures that the people I follow are putting up. Um, so, so I guess some of the, the things that I described already are how it knows you so well. Uh, so the talking about thing is, uh, I am totally flummoxed by, I admit, because <laughs> even with all the things that I know about this, I feel like it happens to me too. Yeah. And yet Facebook is putting out like very clear, like, no, we are not using your microphone to target your ads. <laughs> um, it certainly uses your GPS if you have it turned on. Like we like do that for retail chains and things. And but like, yeah, they claim that if you they claim that they're not using your mic to target ads. I, I don't buy it. And like we are um, in the middle of uh, we're moving in the middle of a home renovation and like my ads are like oh, they, they switch so quickly to like flooring uh, and Home Depot and home, tons and of Home Depot <laughs> and I've been going to those places so it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, they, they should, if they're smart they should be targeting me if I've been in their store. Uh, but um, I had an experience where I went to a, a place that was like yeah, I mean, a, a bar here in Chicago that has like a Michelin star, and we mentioned it. And the next day, I was getting ads for Michelin, Michelin tires. And like the next day, I didn't even I didn't even own a car at the time, so it was like how <laughs> like I haven't said this word, I haven't been around anybody yeah. who said this word, and I'm not in the market for tires. So why am I being targeted for this ad? And so Facebook does have a thing now um, where if you see any ad in your feed, you've got like your three dots or whatever for your settings or your more, you click that and one of the options will be like, why am I targeted for this ad? Right. If you click that, it would say like, you were targeted for this ad because you were on a list that match node LLC updated. And that's like us, even though it's our client's ad. So there is a lot more transparency if you are interested in those kinds of things. Yeah. I have no answer for the audio <laughs> microphone driven one because yeah. I'm in the same boat as you are. Yeah. But uh, they say it's not happening. I feel like it is happening. Uh, but yeah. Wow. How often are you buying things uh, that you see on your Facebook or Instagram feed? Good question. Um, I don't know. Like this is funny <laughs> because asking me in particular reminds me of like a prospect or somebody that we might sit down with that you know, oftentimes they're like really great people. I really like them and they're very successful in what they do. But they'll be like, I don't click on those ads. Like this stuff doesn't work. And I'm like. We only need like one percent of the people to click on the ads, and like that could be an awesome business. So you might we don't we're not concerned with the ninety nine percent who don't click yeah. on the ad. We're like trying to get the one percent who do yeah. click on the ad and like talk to them. Um, but how much stuff do I buy? Um, I don't know. Again, so I, I, I give that like intro about other people saying I don't click on ads. It's like I don't know how much my buying uh, habits are 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 indica indicative of anything. But I guess like. Yeah, I buy I buy some e-commerce stuff here and there. Yeah. Uh, lots of Amazon though, big Amazon Prime family. Um, okay. I'm sure you've heard of Amazon.com, oh, yeah. the website. Um, and like, I do here and there buy like some D2C, like sunglasses are kind of hard because I want to see them on my face. I'm trying to think of the last thing I bought. Shoes and sunglasses are probably like the things that I personally purchase. And I'm okay. like, it feels like a, a demand generated by the ad yes. where I'm like, those are really cool, I have to get them. Yeah. But like, I tend to not go too far in that direction. What is a black hat so, paid hmm. social person? What do they do? Um, that, what is that? I don't even I know. Guess, what, I guess there's like so worst 10%, like the people, uh, like the Russia stuff would be black hat. It's like yeah. you're trying to persuade something, someone of something that you know is not true. You're trying to like mask a click so you like make them think that they're right. going to a certain page. And they go to kind of a different experience that usually doesn't work well because people will bounce. But you know, making things that look like newspapers that aren't, and trying to like try to try to news, try to uh, connect that and hone in on like sure. a vulnerable audience and population. And Facebook allowed like had tools in place to allow people to do that. So it's a bad thing. But like as of today, this is I'm not sure that this is great for us as an ad agency. But I think it's important. Like as of today, you can now go into Facebook and you can delete all of the information they have about you. Wow. 
particularly important on the Pixel because so many websites across the internet have Facebook Pixel on it, and that's how we understand. That's how Instagram ads knows that yeah. comedian so yeah, well is because yeah. of the Pixel because all the websites she's on. Facebook and Instagram know about and gives you a pretty good picture of what you're interested in. That's why those ads are so relevant. Um, so you can go and you can wipe all of that, like as of today. All right, well, Chris, thank you for doing this. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate, I appreciate it. You being Cheers. On search. I think we're going to go beer. to the bar. So I think we're going to go to the bar and uh, get introduced. We'll get, get one more. Yeah, um, love to. All right, let's do it. All right, so we're back with Ben from Off Color. What kind of, what kind of beers are you guys known for? Um, as a brewery, we're very much a fermentation-focused or yeast-driven brewery. Um, most breweries at this point are very hop-focused. Um, we definitely prefer to let the yeast do the talking, so we do a lot of sort of wild fermentation, uh, barrel aging, uh, more experimental type beers. Um, then a bunch of beers inspired by history as well. We have a partnership with the Field Museum where we've done a couple of beers with them as well. We consider ourselves thoughtfully experimental. Um, you can be experimental and do a bunch of silly things and call it an experiment. Um, we would prefer to actually like work off of a base of like really well-made beer and then add that experimentation. Um, make really good beer, do that well, and then build off that. So I think really what sort of fuels us as a brewery is we have that foundation as brewers, but then we build off that and we add our own sort of spin to things and our off-color vibe, and we're always trying to push the envelope forward. What you'll notice, obviously, on tap right now is there's not a single IPA. Um, we don't have an issue with IPAs, but we would prefer to let 99% of the breweries make those beers uh, for about 95% of the people, and we will compete with 1% of the breweries for that 5% more niche market that's looking for you know, higher level beers, more intense beers, beers that have more experimental nature, aging, um, wild yeast focus. Um, so yeah, for us as a brewery, yeast driven, fermentation focus, that's sort of our... Some cool. very good business lessons in there, I think, about chasing trends and everything else. Yeah, um, I almost want to yin and yang them and be like, if you are not doing the hazy IPA that everyone's doing right now, and you're not like over hopping everything like everybody's doing right now, and this exists as like something. I mean, that's, I think different. that niche is really that's important. So we're not going to take over the world doing what we right. do. We don't want to take over right. the world. We right. are a Chicago brewery. 90% of our beer is distributed in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Even as we grow, we expect to sort of hold to that percentage. Cool. Um, so for us, we would really, we look at the fact that we want to be here doing what we're doing 20, 30 years down the line. If we take that sort of big risk and chase the trends, you might make a lot of money for the next few years, but when the trends, trends change, where are you yeah. going to be at? Yeah. Um, you don't know. And even like, you know, when we opened, people were like, oh, you, you're not going to make IPAs? That's crazy. Yeah. Back then, IPAs were still just IPAs. Yeah. Now IPAs have become milkshake IPAs, hazy IPAs, New England style, brewed IPA. IPA. So really, once you start that sort of path, then you have to kind of go with everything. Yeah. And yeah. you see that if you yeah. make an IPA, That's at this point, business. you have to make a yeah. hazy IPA. Yeah. You have to try a brewed oh, IPA. Yeah. So for us, we just really, we don't really worry about what anyone else is doing, regardless of whether they're a small brewery, big brewery. We do what we do. We stay focused on what we do. And I mean, I think that ultimately is possible because John and Dave are our co-owners and our co-founders. They're both our co-head brewers still. So like formulaically, Dave's behind nearly every recipe coming out of the production facility. John brewed every drop of beer out of here last year. So we have a consistency yeah. and an ethos that really has a logical sort of evolution in what we're doing and where we're going because the two people at the top they're not going anywhere. They have no need to evolve into an ownership role where they're not involved in the day-to-day -day and they're not coming up with the recipes. They want to brew beer. That's why they started yeah. this company. Um, we don't have investors that have a meaningful say. Yeah. So I think that allows us to sort of stay true to what we want yeah. to do because no one's knocking down our door being yeah. like, hey, you need to do this yeah, or yeah, this yeah. or that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we very much are, like in the truest sense, a craft brewery. It's a small tight group people have to do everything it's all hands on deck at all times um, but everyone really does have a very shared vision and everyone believes in what we do and really the reason everyone who works for us works for us is because they like the kind of beer we make as yeah. opposed to what 99 percent of other breweries are sort of doing great well ben thank you so much for having us yeah absolutely really enjoyed it. thank it. you chris thanks for joining us
uh, on Suds and Search. We'll we'll be back. I'm gonna finish my beer and uh, yeah, get back to it. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, cheers. Man. All right. Cheers. Thanks.